Warning. Sodium cyanide is extremely poisonous. Perichlorobenzochloride is a carcinogenic lacrimator. Wear gloves when handling them and work in a fume hood. Greetings, fellow nerds. We are now entering step 4 of making pyrimethamine, and to do that, we need to make perichlorophenylacetonitrile, also known as perichlorobenzocyanide. We'll be using the perichlorobenzochloride and the sodium cyanide we made in a previous video. First, we get 50 grams of perichlorobenzochloride. Interestingly enough, today is a cold day in my lab, and the perichlorobenzochloride actually froze solid. Now to this we add 7.2 grams of potassium iodide. The exact quantity is not critical as this is just a catalyst. Now we add 19.3 grams of sodium cyanide. Then we add 250 milliliters of acetone that has been dried overnight with molecular sieves. Remember to add in a stir bar. Now on top of the flask set up a reflux condenser column. Now vigorously stir the mixture and gently raise the temperature until it just starts to reflux. Two things are happening. First, the potassium iodide is reacting with the perichlorobenzyl chloride to form perichlorobenzyl iodide and potassium chloride. Now this might seem odd since organochlorides are more stable than organoiodides, but this reaction works because it's being driven forward by the very low solubility of potassium chloride in acetone. Potassium iodide is slightly soluble so the reaction proceeds forward. This is a useful trick in chemistry to make organochlorides into more reactive organoiodides. It's such a useful reaction that it even has its own name, the Finkelstein reaction. Usually it's done with sodium iodide since that works even better than potassium iodide. I'm using potassium iodide because I ran out of sodium iodide. Now if you're wondering, the aromatic perichlorine does not react because aromatic halides are not susceptible to SN2 nucleophilic substitutions. Okay, after that occurs, the sodium cyanide now reacts with the newly formed perichlorobenzyl iodide to make perichlorobenzyl cyanide, also known as perichlorophenylacetonitrile. The sodium iodide that was produced then goes back into the original step to create more perichlorobenzyl iodide. So we only need a catalytic amount of iodide. Now unfortunately this overall reaction is very slow since it relies on salts with only weak solubility in acetone. Even under refluxing this will take a full 24 hours or so. I'm going to skip ahead until it's complete. And here we are after 24 hours and then letting it cool. Now we have to isolate our product. First we filter over this fretted funnel. To maximize recovery we also wash the salts with acetone. And there is our filtrate. Now perichlorophenylacetonitrile is clear, but our filtrate is orange from the impurities. Anyway, set the filtrate aside and move the fitted funnel to a new collection flask. We now dissolve the residue in water. These salts contain unreacted cyanide and we should deal with that first. Once it's all dissolved, we add oxidant like bleach or hydrogen peroxide. I'm using sodium dichloroisocyanurate, which is a highly soluble form of pool chlorine. The idea is to convert the cyanide into relatively harmless cyanate. Granted, you'll make small amounts of chloroform due to the reaction of hypochlorite with residual acetone, and you'll boil off some of the volatile products due to the heat produced. But I'd much rather deal with that than with cyanide. Once again, make sure you're doing this in a fume hood. Now back to our acetone filtrate. Set up a simple distillation apparatus and distill off the volatile acetone from our reaction mixture. Set the hot plate temperature to 130 celsius. The perichlorophenylacetonitrile boils well above that so we don't have to worry about distilling over. I'm going to wrap my flask in foil to keep in the heat. While I can easily crank the temperature higher, I instead want to be as gentle as possible so we don't burn and decompose our product. Now if you've been following my channel for the past year, you know it's been many months since the last step of my pyrimethamine synthesis. So why such the lengthy delay? Well, I did attempt this back in August, but I failed miserably. Turns out the cyanide I made wasn't pure enough. While it can dissolve gold and such, it wasn't pure enough for organic synthesis. So I had to massively purify it by converting it to Prussian blue, filtering, and then calcining with sodium hydroxide to make pure sodium cyanide that I could then recrystallize from ethanol and water. I had to also remake all my chemicals that I wasted in the August synthesis, and then I ran into a major setback with my hot plate stirrers all breaking. It's only now in December that I'm finally back on track. 
My apologies for such delays. I hope you guys are still on board with the pure methamine synthesis. My major blunder was using bad cyanide and not titrating it to determine the purity. Now due to the excessive dangers of cyanide, I'm not sure if I'll make a video on its repurification and titration. Okay, back to the synthesis. Keep distilling until the temperature starts dropping, indicating everything that can boil at 130 degrees celsius has boiled off. And here is our residue containing our product as well as all the side products and contaminants. Now we need to wash out any water soluble contaminants. Add in 150 milliliters of water and stir. Now the brown color is from small amounts of triiodide resulting from the oxidation of iodide ions with air. To reduce them we add in 15 grams of sodium metabisulfite. This dissolves in the water and reduces the triiodide ions into clear iodide ions. This will help us wash them out. Stir the mixture for about half an hour. You can get even better triiodide removal the longer you react it, but I'm not going to bother. Okay, now using a separatory funnel, recover the lower organic phase and discard the upper aqueous phase. Perichlorophenylacetonitrile is denser than water, so that's why the phase sinks rather than floats as in most organic extractions. And there is our crude perichlorophenylacetonitrile. For better purity, I recommend you wash the organic phase again with 100 ml of distilled water. To increase our purity further, we cool the mixture in the refrigerator to 5 celsius and let it crystallize. Perichlorophenylacetonitrile has a melting point of about room temperature, so we can purify it that way. Just pour off what doesn't solidify. And there we have it, 44 grams of crude product. I'm not going to give a percentage yield because we don't know yet if this material is pure. To get even higher purity, we first remelt the product in hot water, and then we set aside the crude liquid perichlorophenylacetonitrile in a room at 18 degrees celsius and let it sit. A precision temperature controlled cooler is best if you have one. It will very slowly crystallize. Unlike the tiny crystals from putting it in a refrigerator, these very large crystals are much better at excluding impurities. Wait a few days or even weeks until the crystals no longer grow and then pour off liquid. This should be exceptionally pure perichlorophenylacetonitrile. The yield is very low though, about 6 grams or 12%. I'm hoping the leftover supernamed on the left is still pure enough for use even though it didn't crystallize at 18 degrees celsius. But the only way we'll know for certain is through some form of analysis. So I send samples of both the supernamed and the crystals for NMR spectroscopy. Let's first look at the spectrum for the crystals, which we know have to be either exceptionally pure product or exceptionally pure crap if we failed. And this beautifully clean spectrum proves we do have our target perichlorophenylacetonitrile. This peak here corresponds to the benzoic hydrogens over here, and this symmetrical multiplet corresponds to the aromatic hydrogens over here. This here is the water impurities since I didn't ask for dry NMR solvent. And this is the silicone reference standard used to calibrate the scale. We don't actually have this in our sample, it was added in by the analytical laboratory running the machine. I'm actually impressed with just how pure this is. Even my professional synthetic work didn't always meet this level of quality. So we have successfully made high purity perichlorophenylacetonitrile. Our crystallized yield was only 12% though, so let's see if the uncrystallized supernatant is still good to use. And this is the NMR spectrum of the supernatant liquid. It's actually pretty good for an amateur level synthesis. This peak here proves that we have our desired perichlorophenylacetonitrile in relatively high yield. As usual, these are the aromatic peaks from the benzene ring. We have small amounts of water and the silicone reference standard. Interestingly enough, a significant impurity is this stuff. This is perichlorobenzylamine. You're probably wondering how that got in there. It's actually a side product of our reaction. We made perichlorophenylacetonitrile by nucleophilic substitution of cyanide onto a benzoic halide. But cyanide is nucleophilic on both ends. Both the carbon and the nitrogen are nucleophilic and either side can attack the substrate. Now the carbon side is more reactive in water free conditions, which is why we used acetone with the water removed. But attack by nitrogen is not eliminated. What we get as a minority product is perichloral benzyl isocyanide. This stuff is actually quite reactive, and when we stir it with water, we hydrolyze it to form perichloral benzylamine and formic acid. 
The formic acid is soluble in water and was washed out during our washing steps. So what we have left is this perichloro-benzylamine impurity that now appears in our spectrum. We can actually remove this stuff by washing again with some dilute hydrochloric acid. This reacts with the amines and converts them to water soluble salts. Before I do that though, I'm going to spend the next few weeks making a lot more of our products so I have extra in case I blunder again. Additionally, the Enamore laboratory that analyzed my samples is closed for the holidays, so I wasn't able to incorporate an acid wash spectra for this video. Hopefully I'll have that ready for you next month. Anyway, we have successfully made perichloral phenylacetonitrile, also known as perichloral benzyl cyanide. Step 4 in our synthesis of pyrimethamine. Now at this point I should probably point out where we are in our pathway to pyrimethamine. Something I neglected to do earlier on. In my defense, the pathway changed as I progressed as I eliminated many dead ends before they even made it to video, and this seems to be the final pathway I'm settling on. Anyway, we've pretty much covered all the precursors except for guanidine, and I'll probably make another video optimizing one or two precursors. As for the main pathway, we have now just cleared the synthesis of perichloroenolacetonitrile. We have a few more steps to go before we reach our target. Next, we'll try and react perichloroenolacetonitrile with ethylpropionate. Until then, thanks for watching. Special thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon for making these science videos possible with their donations and their direction. If you're not currently a patron but would like to support the continued production of science videos like this one, then check out my Patreon page here or in the video description. I really appreciate any and all support.